Hello, everyone. Welcome to our final session of talks for Cosine for 2021. I think everyone is now really familiar with how this all works. So we're just going to get started right away with our three talks, each of which looks uh, very interesting. Our first talk comes from Goki Okazawa from NYU. And he will be speaking about the geometry of the representation of decision variable and stimulus difficulty in the parietal cor cortex. Goki, take it away when you are ready. Thank you, Tim, for your kind introduction. Let me share the screen. I see now? it, it looks good. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the cosine organizer for having this wonderful event. So today I'm going to talk about the population neural geometry in primate area LIP during decision making. So uh, during perceptual decision making, neurons in various brain regions represent evidence for decision. For example, in a classical uh, random dot discrimination task, animals should decide whether the dot are moving left or right and make an eye movement to the correct target. During this task, when we record from neurons in oculomotor brain regions such as LIP, you see neural activity reflecting the evidence for the neuron's preferred target location. For example, when the rightward target is inside the neuron's response field, then the rightward motion would evoke stronger activity of the recording LIP neurons during uh, stimulus presentation. And this kind of activity has been explained using circuit model, where there are two pools of neurons preferring each action, receive opposing sensory input, and compete with each other until one of them wins and dictate a decision. And this kind of model would produce activity pretty similar to what we see in experimental data. So there are several key ideas here. First, average neural activity during this task reflect evidence for decision or the decision variable. Another point is that the same action competition process would happen for any perceptual task because the competition is happening at the motor level. But most previous study used simplified sensory stimuli such as random dot for st to study perceptual decision making. So we tested these key ideas by comparing LIP neural activity during two perceptual task, the classical motion discrimination task, and our new phase categorization task, which use naturalistic phase stimuli. In the motion task after fixation onset, two targets appear, and one of them is in, in, inside LIP neurons response field. Then the motion stimulus appears, and after delay, animals should choose one of the two targets, depending on the direction of the motion. In case of phase task, we simply use the phase stimulus instead. Now the two targets are associated with two facial categories, either in this case, either monkey or human face. And we created a continuous morph between the two facial categories to control the stimulus difficulty. And we presented one of the intermediate level in each trial. But at the same time, during stimulus presentation, there's a slight fluctuation of morph level over time interleaved by mask, which is going to give noisy sensory evidence for subjects. And we have two versions of phase task, uh, species categorization and expression categorization. When we look at behavior, they are pretty similar between the two tasks. So uh, when the stimulus strength is stronger, then animals made more correct decision. And more importantly, when the stimulus duration is longer, then animal made more, uh, animal's performance was more accurate, as you see decrease in behavioral threshold. This indicates that in both tasks, animals are using multiple stimulus frames for making decision. So because of this similarity of behavior, we expected that similar neural activity would be seen in LIP between the two tasks. But surprisingly, we found opposite pattern of fine grade. So here I'm showing the population average fine grade during motion task. Reddish lines indicate that when the monkey chose a target inside response field, bluish line target outside response field, and the darker color indicates stronger stimulus strength. So when the stimulus strength is, stimulus is strongly supporting the choice of the target inside response field, the activity is greater 
consistent with the idea that these neurons encode the decision variable. But in the phase task, we saw the opposite patterns. So when the sensory stimulus is weaker, then activity was greater than the case that the sensory stimulus was stronger. So the, so the order of fine grade is reversed for the T in choice. So this appeared to be inconsistent with the idea that neurons encode the decision variable. So we are quite puzzled by these findings. So we started to analyze neural data in more details and uh, specifically look at the activity of population activity in the state space. So here is what, what we did. So we have many neurons who respond, which respond to different stimulus strengths. So instead of averaging neural activity, we performed PCA and extracted low dimensional state space. So in this state space, we found that interesting structure. So here, each point corresponds to the population activity for a particular stimulus strength for a particular, at a particular moment in time. And we found that the neural activity for different stimulus strengths are aligned along a curved manifold. Along this manifold, there appears to be a monotonic encoding of the stimulus strengths. And interestingly, we found similar kind of curved manifold even during the motion task. Over time, this curved structure gradually expanded during decision formation after stimulus onset. So if you look at the population geometry, it seems the neurons encode the decision variable similarly between the two tasks. Then why we saw the opposite find rate in the two tasks? Actually, there's an intuitive explanation. So here I'm looking at the state space where each axis corresponds to the find rate of each neuron. Then the population average find rate corresponds to the projection of a neural state along the axis of average find rate, which is a vector composed of one. And PCA is also linear dimension reduction. So in PC space, we can find the same axis that encodes the average fine rate. So if you want to know the uh, average fine rate of each state, you can again project to that neural state along this vector. And by doing that, we found that the order is reversed in the phase tag because of the curvature. And that corresponds to the reversal of fine rate. But in the motion task, even though the manifold is still curved, the projection of the neural state along this axis didn't lead to reversal. So it's only about the relative position of the curved manifold and the vector of x average fine rate that lead to reversal or non-reversal. So it's an interesting finding, but what does this finding tell us about neural computation? Here I'd like to emphasize two points. First, it seems the LIP neurons encoding decision variable in a task dependent manner and second there's a partial dissociation of the encoding of the decision variable and action plan so let me explain that in the following slide so in terms of task dependency we've already seen that in the phase task and motion task it seems the position of the neural manifold appear to be largely changing to quantify this task dependency we recorded from exactly the same neural population from the same monkey, while the monkey performed two versions of phase categorization tasks, species and expression tasks. And by looking at the neural population in the same PC space, we found that in both tasks, the population activity forms a curved manifold, but the position of the manifold were actually distinct. This indicates that the population neural activity are somewhat different between the two tasks during decision formation. And because of this task dependency, the optimal readout of the decision variable should also be task dependent. So from the manifold of each task, we can find the axis that best decode decision variable from the population. And the important finding here is that that best decoding axis is not the same between the two tasks, but there are angles, there is angles. And because of this angle, if we want to decode the decision variable from one task using the uh, either of the uh, using one of the two decoder, depending on the decoder you use, we see a huge bias in the decoded value. 
So if the downstream circuit want to decode the decision variable from the population activity, it should be aware of the task context to optimally read out the information. Another point I want to emphasize is a partial dissociation of the decision variable and action encoding. So during decision formation, we see that the neural activity forms curvature. And what I want to look at now is the same neurons activity when an animal is making a choice by making a saccade. And during the saccade preparation, the average fine grade converts to one of the two level, depending on the animal choice. And also the population neural activity converts to one of the two level, two, two states that correspond to the two choices. So if we compare the pattern of neural activity during decision formation and saccade preparation, it's clear that the patterns are quite distinct. So the same population encoded decision variable in action in a different pattern so that the encoding of the decision variable is not just a scaled version of the, of the action encoding. So what we found so far is that it is wrong to consider that average fine, LIP fine grade always approximates the decision variable for any perceptual task. But our new idea is that the decision variable is encoded on a curved manifold, which is partially dissociated from action encoding. And this manifold positions change depending on task. And because of this, because of this the optimal readout of the decision variable should also be task dependent. So we are trying to develop model that would explain these kind of findings. But let me finish by uh, proposing one possible hypothesis that might explain why the manifold is curved. So we think that simple biophysical constraint might, might explain why the manifold is curved. Again, back in the state space, the population neurons want to encode one dimensional dynamics, which is decision variable. But the fine rate of neurons cannot take any value. For example, it cannot be negative or it cannot be very large. So actually in the state space, the neuron has neuron have to encode one dimensional dynamics in a constrained space like this box. So if you want to encode one dimensional dynamics in this constrained space, one way would be to have a linear line like this. But this may not be ideal because the dynamic range of the activity could be limited and many neurons should maintain high firing rate to uh, encode this linear line. So actually, an energetically efficient way to encode one dimensional dynamics could be to form a curvature like this. To test this possibility, we develop a spiky network model that receives stimulus as an input and generate accumulated evidence decision variable and we, we design network in a way that the spike is generated uh, efficiently only when it's encode decision variable. And what we found is that this spiky network model also formed curved manifold similar to experimental data. But another important finding we had is context dependency. So depending on task, the manifold position changes. So for this, we are still trying to implement how this uh, task dependency um, could, uh, could emerge in a uh, spike network model. So in summary, we found that the decision variable is formed along a task-dependent curved manifold. And these findings cannot be explained by task-invariant action competition circuit. So they require extending models of perceptual decision-making. And I didn't have time to go over, but we also found that the reversal or fine rate cannot be explained by other factors such as task engagement, attention, and confidence. And we also found similar curved manifold in prefrontal areas encoding decision variable during this task. So it seems this curved manifold is ubiquitous across the brain-wide network involved in decision formation. With that, I'd like to thank my mentor, Ruzbe Kiani, and the member of Kiani Lab and the Mackens Lab at Champlain Mode for developing spiking model. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Goki, for a very interesting talk. Uh, we already have some questions in Slido, so we'll start with those right away as others uh, fill in more questions at the same time. And of course, you can upvote those questions. So I'm just going to go. 
uh, in the order of the votes here. So uh, the first question comes from Yard and Cohen, and the question is, does the data support a curved manifold significantly better than two separate linear manifolds, one for each category? That, that is a very great question. Uh, we haven't uh, quantitatively tested that, but that should be the case if, say, uh, let, let me think about it again. I see. So uh, it's could be a, uh, it could be a piece for a linear manifold. Uh, so it's hard to distinguish these two uh, quantitatively. Uh, in this plot, I'm showing correct trials only. So if I plot all trials, actually the curved uh, manifold could, could look more curved. So I believe it is uh, actually curved, but yeah, it's difficult to actually quantitatively test whether this is a really curved or it could be kind of piecewise linear. Okay, great. Uh, the next question comes from Henning uh, Spreckler. And the question is, if the manifold corresponds to a decision variable, the time evolution should travel along the manifold generated by varying stimulus strengths. Does it do that? Yes. Uh, so the fact is that uh, actually, if you look at the data, so it's kind of, uh, we can, see the manifold as kind of two dimensions. So uh, the manifold itself is gradually expanding, but at the same time, the base of manifold appear to be kind of con uh, constant, gradually constant over time. So which means that uh, we can think of like a one point of space as origin. And, and as, a, as a system accumulate evidence, the neural state gradually expand and go to the two sides of the manifold to, to have more wide, wider dyna dynamic range of encoding decision variable. Okay, great. Uh, the next question comes from uh, Shin Kira, and the question is, why do you think the population average activity is always ordered for the motion discrimination task across monkeys, as opposed to some of them showing this reversal? Yes, that's a great question. Uh, we do not know, but that is true. So in, in case of motion task in any monkeys, it's always ordered. So there's some innate property of uh, certain sensory input or certain task that always create a certain order or certain uh, geometry in the population space uh, during decision formation. So I think this uh, relationship between certain sensory input or task and the neural geometry is quite pre well preserved across animals. So we, to answer, we still do not know why in the motion task it's always ordered, but uh, there should be certain principle that is, that is governing the relevance between the curvature position and axis of average bank rate. And I think that already answers the next question on the uh, vote register here, which is, does the manifold remain the same if the monkeys perform the same task again? Uh, by by you, Lou. Yep. So it's going to remain the same, yeah, for the same task. Okay, we have time for one more question here. So we're going to go for a question by uh, Maximilian Tuzel, which is, wouldn't any trajectory with a particular correlation time and smoothness give a curve? Can you exclude this? For example, longer recordings, uh, comparing short and long trials. So, so one thing I can clearly answer is the extent of curvature are clearly different between the phase and motion task as you saw, and uh, recording condition recording condition are quite similar between the two tasks. So uh, I do I need to think about whether this could be this could actually happen. But uh, based on this task dependency, it's kind of clear that this is something real in the actual neural data. Okay, great. Uh, thank you again, Goki. Thank uh, you very we much. We will uh, move to our next speaker here. Yep. Uh, yeah. And uh, you can go uh, back off the stage at this time uh, as we make that move. Okay, uh, welcome to our next speaker. This talk comes from Mikhail Genkin from Cold Spring Harbor. 
and he'll be speaking about flexible identification of neural population dynamics underlying decision making. Mikkel, take it away when you are ready, and I'll let you know that your slides are showing properly. Thank you. Um, one moment. They look good here. Looks good? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I want to thank the organizers for this amazing opportunity. Uh, my name is Mikhail, and today I will be presenting you flexible identification of neural population dynamics underlying decision making. So, a brief introduction. Actually, the previous speaker already covered some of it. So, in a typical decision making task, uh, an animal is presented with a stimulus, and its goal is to make a categorical choice based on the stimulus. For example, to determine whether a net motion of the dots is directed to the left or to the right, and report its decision somehow, like by touching the corresponding target or making a saccade. And uh, it was found out that in many cortical regions, many neurons modulate their trial average firing rate depending on the chosen site and stimulus difficulties. For example, in this picture, you can see the trial average responses of LIP neurons ramp up for one of the sites and ramp down or show no modulation for another site. And the rate of this ramping is higher for easier stimuli. Uh, so the easy stimulus is shown with orange color and for the difficult stimulus that is shown with the blue color, the, the rate of ramping is lower. And uh, this ramping of the trial average firing rates is uh, reminiscent of a drift diffusion process, where the trajectory evolves under a constant drift and stochastic diffusion. And uh, so here, uh, the drift force will be positive for a stimulus pointing to the left, and the higher drift magnitudes will correspond to easier stimuli. And for the stimulus pointing to the right, the drift force will be negative and it will push the trajectory towards the lower decision boundary. Um, so this similarity between the observed trial average firing rates and drift diffusion process suggests that on single trials, neurons accumulate evidence towards one or another choice through a process similar to the drift diffusion. However, the same trial average responses can arise from different types of dynamics on single trials which represents alternative models of decision computations. Um, so recently, two alternative hypotheses of single trial computations were suggested, ramping and stepping. Uh, the ramping model postulates smooth increase or decrease of the firing rates on single trials, while the stepping model suggests discontinuous jumps between the attractors. Uh, both models, when averaged over many trials, will exhibit the smooth increase or decrease of the firing rates observed experimentally. And uh, you can see that the spike rasters for these two hypotheses look qualitatively similar, despite the clear differences in the firing rates. However, this approach is limited to only a few hypotheses, while the true dynamics can differ from both ramping and stepping. And the reality is even more complicated because in many studies, the authors observe very heterogeneous single neural responses. For example, in a recent study, uh, dorsal premotor activity was recorded, and you can see that the observed single neural responses are very heterogeneous. While some of the neurons exhibit these canonical responses where they uh, ramp up on average for one of the site and show no modulation for another site, uh, there were many neurons with non-canonical responses. For example, some of the neurons decrease their firing rate for one of the sites, and other neurons exhibit some complex uh, temporal behavior and only show the modulation very late, just before the response time. So the absor this observed heterogeneity challenges the traditional wisdom that each neuron accumulates the evidence towards one or another threshold. So it is not clear how the common decision computation arises from the, these diverse single neural responses. Uh, we developed a computational framework uh, for analysis of decision-making activity to address uh, these two challenges that I mentioned. So first of all, how to account for many alternative hypotheses of decision-making within a single modeling framework and do not limit ourselves to just a few hypotheses. And second, how can 
the observed diversity of single neural responses support a common decision computation. So in our framework, we describe a decision-making dynamics by a general, or you can think about it as a decision variable, uh, as a by a general nonlinear dynamical system equation, uh, which is also called Langevin equation in physics. So here's the evolution of this like population state or latent state or decision state is controlled by deterministic and stochastic terms. The de deterministic term is determined by a potential function phi of x and the stochastic term is a Gaussian noise. The flexibility of our approach comes from the potential functions that can take any arbitrary shape and different shapes corresponds to different dynamics. For example, the ramping model with a constant drift would correspond to a linear potential. While for the stepping model, the potential will have two barriers so that the trajectory will have to jump over one of the barriers in order to reach one of the decision boundaries. Uh, the potential function can take arbitrary shape depending on the data. For example, uh, here you can see uh, a different potential with multiple attractors. And this model is, is clearly different from the stepping and ramping. Uh, now, let's see how our framework works with just one neuron. Uh, we assume that the spike data on the right is generated from the latent state X of T by inhomogeneous Poisson process with an instantaneous firing rate lambda of T given by a latent state through a firing rate function F of X. And the latent state uh, is controlled by this uh, general nonlinear dynamical system equation that depends on the potential function phi of X. We also model a distribution of initial latent states at the start of each trial by a function P0 of X. So here for the illustration, I provide a simple example where P0 of X is a narrow Gaussian distribution so that each trial will start near the center of the latent space. So here you can see a ramping model. So for example, if a stimulus is pointing towards the green boundary, we would expect the potential shape to have a negative slope, like shown here, so that the trajectory will be pushed towards a green boundary. And uh, as you can see from this movie, uh, in this case, most of the time, the latent trajectory will reach the green decision boundary and the monkey will make a correct choice. However, sometimes noise will drive the trajectory to the incorrect boundary, which will lead to an error choice. And uh, uh, on the bottom, you can see an example of a, stepping, of a model with a stepping potential. In this case, the latent trajectory will jump over one of the barriers on single trials. And again, if stimulus is pointing towards the green boundary, we will expect that it will be easier to jump over the right barrier. However, sometimes the trajectory will jump towards the orange boundary, and this will lead to an incorrect decision. And for... Uh, for those who are interested in details, we already published two manuscripts, so you can you can check it out. And in the case of multiple neural responses, we assume that there is a single latent state or population state or decision variable state uh, that is generated by by a single nonlinear dynamical system equation with a potential function. And for each neuron, we will have its own firing rate function that links each of the individual neural responses to a common population state. Uh, the firing rate functions can also take arbitrary shape that allows our framework to incorporate the observed heterogeneity of neural responses into a single decision computation performed by, the, by a population. So uh, a little... Uh, uh, one slide about how, how do we feed, how do we make the inference in our framework. Uh, given the spike data y of t, our goal is to find the potential function phi of x, noise magnitude d, all of the firing rate function, and the p0 of x from data. To do the inference, we maximize the likelihood by analytically deriving variational derivatives of the likelihood with respect to all of this function and then use a derived expression to optimize the likelihood numerically with Adam algorithm. So to illustrate the optimization course, I generated a synthetic data with two neural responses uh, from a ramping model. Uh, here you can see, yeah, here you can see the ground truth 
uh, are shown in black and the fitting parameters are shown with colors. So you can see that we start our optimization at some unspecific initial guess. And uh, after some time, uh, Adam algorithm iteratively updates all of this like governing function and uh, the fitting result closely overlap with the ground truth after, after some number of epochs. Okay. Uh, we validated our framework uh, on uh, ramping and stepping hypothesis. Uh, so I've generated a realistic amount of synthetic data from ramping and stepping models. And I was able to accurately feed both of the models from the generated spike data. Uh, and I started with the same initialization, which is a flat potential. And you can see that my fitting results closely overlap with the ground truth. Um, so after validating uh, uh, the framework on synthetic data, uh, I analyzed PMD activity recorded with a multi-channel electrode from uh, primate's brain. So here a macaque is involved in a decision-making task where the goal is to find a dominant color, red or green, from a static stimulus on the screen and report the decision by touching one of the targets. As I mentioned earlier, the observed activity was very heterogeneous across neurons so that it is hard to analyze this data set with traditional modeling tools, while our framework can naturally account for the observed diversity. We started our analysis with single neural responses. Uh, here I analyzed the case where the correct choice was left, like left side, and uh, with the intermediate stimulus difficulty. Uh, here, uh, on top, you can see the trial average neural responses, and in the bottom, you can see the discovered dynamics. So you can see that the fitted potential consists of two roughly linear regions separated by a potential barrier. And the initial distribution P0 of X is a narrow distribution uh, picked uh, to the left from the potential barrier. This suggests that for the correct responses, which goes to the left side, the dynamics smoothly flows towards the left boundary. And for the wrong responses, there is a jumping over the barrier in order to reach the right side of, of the, of the uh, decision space. So our modeling results really differs from the ramping and stepping models proposed previously. And we analyzed uh, about 40 neural responses with heterogeneous trial average firing rates and nearly everywhere, the results for the potential and P0 of X were consistent. So here you can see another example. And you can see that potential and P0 of X look qualitatively similar. Uh, we qualified the goodness of fit for our framework by estimating the variance explained on validation data. So across 26 neural responses, our framework explained about 27% of the total neural variance. And just to, for comparison, just to guide your eye, we also calculated the variance explained by the PSTH model that estimates neural firing rates by trial average responses. So this model does not account for the inter-trial variability because it averages the responses over many trials. So it explains very little amount of total variance. Uh, this illustrates that there is a significant trial-to-trial -trial variability in the data and that our framework can faithfully capture this variability. Uh, to, to, uh, to move this point even further, um, we decompose the total variance by two parts, the firing rate variance uh, that can be accounted by the model in principle and the point process variance that comes from the neural's internal variability. So the point process variance cannot be accounted by any model so it is advantageous just to remove it from the consideration. And for each of the neurons we analyzed, we used an independent method to separate the total variance into firing rate variance and point process variance. And we only consider the former. And you can see that our framework explains about 66% of the firing rate variance, which is a, a significant digit. And for the guidance, again, PSTH model uh, only accounts for less than 10% of the firing rate variance. So uh, after that, we analyzed several neural responses recorded simultaneously. Here I show you an example for uh, four, neural, uh, four neurons analysis. And consistent with our expectation, the firing rate functions of each of these neurons were different. 
because they reflect the diversity of the single neural responses. But if you look at the fitted potential phi of x and the initial distribution of the latent states, p0 of x, you can see that the discovered model is qualitatively similar to what we have seen before on single neurons. So our results reveal a model of decision-making dynamics that smoothly evolves for the correct choice and jumps over the barrier for the incorrect choice. It differs from the ramping and stepping models proposed previously. Uh, how can we interpret our results and what does it tell us about the decision-making mechanism in PMD? Um, so here, uh, let me uh, let me step a little bit aside. So here you can see uh, a classical uh, neural network model for decision making developed by Wang and later analyzed by Wang and Wang. You already saw it in, in a number of previous talks in this conference. Um, the network consists of one inhibitor and two excited repulse of integrated and fired neurons. The excited repulse receives stimulus information uh, that increases their activity and the competition is realized by the inhibitor pool. The network exhibit a winner-take-all dynamics. For example, in the trial where pool E2 wins, the population average firing rate of E2 will gradually ramp up, while the firing rate of E1 will uh, first ramp up, but then it will be suppressed. Uh, so this network has two attractors, one with a high firing rate of E1 pool and another with a firing rate of E2 pool. Uh, this system can be analyzed analytically by a mean field analysis. Here you can see a 2D phase plane of the activities of these two excitatory pools. The flow field shows the direction of the trajectory at each point of the phase space. Before stimulus, the system stays in a low firing rate state, shown with a pink dot. After stimulus presentation, the system has three stable points, two attractors shown in red. Each uh, corresponds to a state with high activity of one of the pools, and unstable saddle point in between them, shown in blue. We can find a stable direction of the saddle point here, which will serve as a separatrix for the system. So in the absence of noise, the trajectories that start below the separatrix will converge towards the lower attractor, like here, while the trajectories above the separatrix will go to another attractor. So for the case shown here, most of the time, the system will converge towards the lower attractor. However, due to the presence of noise, the trajectory can be pushed through the separatrix and converge to the second attractor. And our one-dimensional model will capture a one-dimensional slice of this 2D phase plane. For example, this one, which lies along an unstable manifold of a saddle point. So if you take the flow field and reconstruct the potential uh, along this like unstable manifold, the potential function will be really similar to what we have seen before. So it will be a potential with a single barrier. So I simulated this, uh, this network and I analyzed spike data with my framework. Here I'll just show you the potential on P0 of X. And you can see that potential function consists of two linear regions separated by a potential barrier. And P0 of X is centered to the left from a potential barrier. So this model is qualitatively similar to what we have obtained on PMD data. Here is the PMD results. So this suggests that PMD dynamics during decision-making resembles the dynamics of attractor network and differs from ramping and stepping models proposed previously. So in conclusion, we developed a flexible framework for discovering decision-making dynamics, which can account for uh, heterogeneity of single neuron responses, and uh, the dynamics discovered in PMD data differ from the ramping and stepping models proposed previously and uh, is qualitatively similar to the attractor network dynamics. And with that, I would like to acknowledge Engels lab. First of all, my supervisor, Tatiana Engel, also Sina Akhama Hamadi and James Roach, our collaborators, Chandra Muli, Chandra Zikaran, and Krishna Shinoi and Owen Hughes our funding sources, and feel free to contact us if you're interested. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mikhail, for another very interesting talk. We have an active uh, Slido board here of questions, so I'll go through as many as I can in the time we have. The first one, based on votes, is how is the potential function parameterized? So, yeah, I didn't have time to talk about it, but we, as I said, like we 
we derive the expression for the gradients analytically. So in our framework, in our like analysis, we really treat it as a continuous function. And we only parameterize it in the very end when we estimate the gradients numerically. We actually use like, we use, uh, what how is it called? Um, uh, I'm sorry, Lagrange polynomials for, for the expansion. But in principle, you can use, you can use any parameterization and uh, like we only use it at the very last step when we when we do it in the computer. While well, yeah, well, yeah. Okay, let's do one more question here. Uh, the the question is: the tractor dynamics are a network effect. Can a model of this kind describe population dynamics? How does that work? I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? So the question is: the tractor dynamics are a network effect. Can a model of this kind describe population dynamics? How does that work? I'm not sure I correctly understand the question. The attractor dynamics is a network effect. So our framework, uh, it analyzes spiking activity. It does not, it does not consider the, like the data is generated by some network. It's just, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure I, I completely understood the question. So. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we are going to move on to the next speaker. Uh, so uh, you can move back to the backstage uh, while we wait for the next speaker. Sure. Uh, so uh, welcome to our next speaker, Ramanujan Srinath from University of Pittsburgh. And he will be speaking about how attention improves information flow between neuronal populations without changing the communication subspace. Ram, your slides look like they're working, so take it away when you're ready. Thanks very much. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you, Tim, for that introduction, and thank you to the program committee and the organizing committee for giving me the opportunity to give a talk and for what has been a very well-attended and engaging online conference. I'm excited to tell you about some recent work that investigates how visual attention affects the information flow between areas. In this talk, uh, I will share evidence that supports the hypothesis that attention improves information flow by showing you that predictions of activity from one region to, to the other improves with attention. And I will show you that this effect is not contingent on changes in dimensionality of either the local populations or the dimensionality of the shared variability across two areas. In the lab, we are particularly interested in how internal cognitive states like attention affect perception and therefore behavior, and the neural algorithms that support these effects. Primates, including humans, are very good at paying attention to parts of a visual scene. Here, the smaller monkeys are fixated on the banana, but they're also covertly monitoring the gaze and the position and the behavior of the other monkeys, especially the monkey with the food. Because it's rude to make eye contact in monkey society, it would be prudent of the smaller monkeys to act as if they were looking elsewhere while paying attention to the food and the potential wrath of the bigger monkeys. In the lab with training, monkeys can shift their attention to different parts of the screen based on instructive cues. We can measure large measurable effects of these shifts in attention in their behavior. Here, the monkeys were trained to pay attention to a location on the screen. They then held their gaze at a central spot while identical Gabor stimuli were flashed repeatedly on the screen. After a random number of presentations, the direction of one of those Gabor stimuli would change and the monkey was rewarded for detecting and immediately moving its gaze towards that change. As the magnitude of this change increases, the change is easier to detect. But if the monkey was paying attention to that location of the change, then behavioral performance improves markedly. That is the vertical difference that you see between these, uh, this yellow and blue dot here. This behavioral difference uh, under identical stimulus conditions makes attention a great model for studying neural coding. Over the past few years, many labs have studied the changes in firing rates and tuning functions of single neurons, and more recently, the changes in population activity that accompany these behavioral changes. We 
analyzed data from a recent study in which Dr. Douglas Ruff from our lab uh, recorded from populations of motion selective visual neurons in cortical area MT and visual and saccade related neurons in SC, the superior colliculus, a midbrain structure that is involved in uh, visual motor processing, attention, the generation of saccadic eye movements, etc. He studied the aspects of population activity in visual area MT that are that best accounted for attention related changes in behavior. In this talk, uh, I want to share evidence, uh, well, I want to address how flexibility in the routing of information between areas may be a substrate for behavioral flexibility in the context of attention. I believe these data are uniquely suited for this task because Doug recorded from dozens of neurons from both MT and SC with overlapping receptive fields, which helps us to assess the nature of information that is shared between these two populations and how attention may flexibly alter the efficacy of this communication. Right. To test whether or not attention improves communication between two areas, first, uh, let me define what I mean. Here, I'm going to use the prediction accuracy of a linear model as a proxy for the efficacy of communication between two areas. Now, assume that this matrix contains the spike rates from a population of empty neurons elicited by the same visual stimulus across presentations. I will take the numbers away just for clarity. And this matrix uh, represents the spike rates from the simultaneously recorded SC population on the same trials. Now, if the activity of a single empty neuron was predictive of the activity of a single SC neuron, then we would fit a linear model and the cross-validation loss would be the measure of prediction accuracy. We could do the same with two empty neurons and we could do the same where we are trying to predict the population activity of uh, each SC neuron as well. When we do this, we see a large difference in how well we can predict SC activity from MT activity between attention conditions. Attend in here refers to the trials where the monkey was directing its attention within the joint receptive fields of the MT and SC neurons. And attend out refers to the trial where the monkey was directing its attention to the opposite hemifield. On the x-axis, uh, we are increasing the number of MT neurons that are predicting the full SC population. And on the y-axis is the cross-validated prediction accuracy. For each of these steps, we sampled N neurons without replacement from the MT population 100 times, and we used ridge regression to find the weights. Now, this is a simple but powerful result. To be able to predict the activity better in a particular cognitive state constrains mechanistic models of attention. But could this enhanced prediction be because, say, um, empty activity alone changes in a particular way? Well, to test whether attention affects communication by only changing local populations, we, we can split the empty population in half and rerun the analysis. Uh, that is to say, try to predict the activity of a subset of empty neurons with another subset of empty neurons. In other words, we compared the within area communication with a cross area communication to delineate the effect of attention. Importantly, we chose a subset of neurons to be the source population and predict the activity of either the rest of the MT target neurons or the activity of the SC target neurons. I will keep referencing to, to the MT to SC regression uh, just for consistency, but we also studied the SC to MT direction and compared it with the within SC communication. And we did this uh, random split 100 times to validate our findings. Also, we want to find out how many dimensions of empty activity are sufficient to explain SC variability. Here, the blue dimension seems to be the dimension along which SC activity is predictable. If all of the regression dimensions lie on a plane, let's say, then the plane would rep represent the subspace, subspace through which empty and SC communicate. And any variance that is orthogonal to the plane would represent variance that is not useful for MT to SC regression and therefore private to MT. Using this concept, we can find A, how many dimensions of MT activity are shared with SC forming a communication subspace, and B, whether this communicate, uh, whether the number of dimensions changes with, uh, with attention.
Well, luckily we can find out both prediction performance and predictive dimensions with a technique called reduced rank regression. It was, it was used by Joao Semedo and colleagues to find that there was a communication subspace between V1 and V2. Here we want to find out whether or not uh, there is a communication subspace between MT and SC or the opposite of that, where all of the dimensions of MT are needed to predict SC population activity. And, and perhaps more importantly, we want to find out whether or not attention changes this communication channel. Based on this method, we have several hypotheses about how attention may change information flow. Attention could either alter within area dimensionality. That means uh, this orange plane here on the left uh, that represents the private subspace could change from let's say two to three dimensions. Uh, the corollary to that is that the shared dimensionality changes. So the blue plane changes from, let's say, two to three dimensions. Another prediction could be that attention could alter private communication only. That means that the prediction between uh, becomes better in private dimensions. That means uh, MT to MT prediction improves, uh, for instance, or SC to SC prediction improves or attention could alter across area communication. So prediction becomes better in shared dimensions. Uh, therefore, MT to SC prediction improves and vice versa. So for a single session across all randomized pairs of populations, prediction of SC activity from MT activity improves with attention. On the x-axis here, we are plotting the number of dimensions of empty activity that are used for the reduced rank regression and the number of dimensions, um, and that is the number of dimensions that is shared between MT and SC. The number on the y-axis is represents how well we can do this prediction. The orange dots here represent the two principal quantities we want to track, the prediction accuracy and the number of shared dimensions. Now to view this effect across sessions, I will calculate the ratio of the quantities on the two axes here uh, across attention conditions. So the points marked in orange on the left would translate to a single point on these new set of axes uh, that represent the attention related change in prediction performance and the attention related change in the number of predictive dimensions. For this session, that point would lie here. Now across sessions, if points are grouped near one, that would mean that attention does not affect communication in any way. If they are on average greater than one on the x-axis, that would mean attention improves prediction accuracy while keeping the number of dimensions in the communication channel the same. If it is smaller than one on the y-axis, that would mean that while the prediction accuracy is the same, Attention reduces the number of dimensions that are required for communication. If it's greater than one on the y-axis, that means attention increases the number of shared dimensions. If they're greater than one on both axes, that would mean attention increases the number of dimensions and prediction accuracy. And there may, there may be a relationship between those two. When we plot all of our sessions, overwhelmingly we see that attention improves prediction without changing the number of predictive dimensions. Also, we see that predictive performance improves across regions, but not within regions. For across area predictions in orange and pink here, the MT to SC prediction and SC to MT prediction, we see that prediction is markedly better for the attending trials, but the number of predictive dimensions does not change. On the other hand, for within area uh, predictions, neither changes with attention, neither the accuracy nor the number of uh, shared dimensions. We compared these improvements in prediction accuracy with changes in firing rate with uh, pairwise spike count correlations, changes in the number of explanatory uh, PCA dimensions or factor analysis dimensions, and we found no relationship between those. Uh, as I just said, we, we did factor analysis to find the dimensionality of local populations to compare with the number of predictive dimensions for each of these communication channels. We see that attention does not alter the dimensionality of any communication channel. I mean, we already saw this as a, uh, you know, in ratios, but these are the actual numbers. And the reason why I'm showing you this is that it seems like the number of predictive dimensions across MT and SC is up to three. So if you look at the axes on the orange plot and the pink plot, they seem to be 
um, up to three, but the number of predictive dimensions within MT and SC are up to six. So I'm not sure if you can see my cursor. Oh, there. So these dimensions are up to six over here. So there are more dimensions in MT than are shared with SC in both attend-in and attend-out conditions. To visualize this, we can replot the same points on a different set of axes. That is the number of MT dimensions, the red points over here, against the number of shared dimensions between MT and SC, which are the orange points. Now, if the points lie on the diagonal, then all of the population dimensions are required for prediction. If they lie below the diagonal, then only a subset of the dimensions are required, forming a communication subspace. And this is what replotting of the same points looks like for the attend in condition. The points for inter aerial communication, MT to SC, here are below the diagonal, and the points for intra aerial communication, which is MT to MT, are on the diagonal. This means that MT and SC indeed communicate via a subspace of activity. Here are the attend out data. And as usual, I'm going to plot the quantities uh, on the two axes here as, a, as ratios to see how attention affects the communication subspace. And all the points here are clustered near one, which means that attention-related improvements in predictive performance are not accompanied by a change in dimensionality of the communication subspace. In conclusion, uh, attention improves information flow based on improvements in prediction accuracy uh, across neuronal populations, but not within MT or SC without changing the dimensionality of the communication subspace. I would like to, uh, like to thank Dr. Douglas Ruff who collected these data and helped me analyze them, my PI, Dr. Marlene Cohen, and the lab's funding sources. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ron, for a, another great talk here. Uh, we have a number of questions. I'm gonna go with the methods question first. Is Which layer of, of SC are you recording and are the SC and cortical receptive or motor fields aligned? Uh, that is an excellent question. Um, we try to, because these are uh, recordings from movable long shank probes, uh, we try to penetrate um, almost perpendicular to the uh, laminae so as to get uh, several laminae. Um, th there are, we calculated a score based on the responses just before saccades and during saccades and uh, with the stimuli on. And we calculated a visual motor score. Uh, when I classify the SC uh, neurons based on this visual motor score and then do the same um, predictions between MT and SC and within SC and so on and so forth, uh, I see that there is not a lot of difference. There is a slight effect that uh, MT is better able to predict uh, SC visual neurons better than SC ocular motor neurons, but that's a very small effect. Uh, and I'd have to um, cross validate that uh, uh, effect to find out whether or not it really exists. Great. Uh, so the next question is, what do your results say about information flow in case there's not a linear mapping between MT and SC? Is your analysis a lower bound on the true information? Again, excellent question. Um, these are, op, uh, as you noted, these are all linear methods. Uh, it could be that there is a, um, uh, the communication, well, um, my guess would be that almost definitely uh, communication is in some way nonlinear. So there might be a better method, um, a nonlinear method that can uh, delineate that. But the fact that we find the subspace in these linear uh, dimensions is sort of testament to the fact that, um, uh, you know, We apologize for a slight technical difficulty there. We wanted to get one more technical difficulty and just before the end of the meeting, uh, I also apologize if we miss a question. We're going to try to rewind a bit here and go through some of these excellent questions. And, and Ram gave excellent answers, I assure you. Uh, so we're going back. And if I missed one, I apologize. Uh, so this question is, are these effects attention specific? What would happen if you use this analysis to compare spontaneous activity to no attention stimulus evoked activity? Uh, yes, that's a great question. Uh, uh, these um, MT and SC neurons are extremely visually driven, so they have very high uh, firing rates for when the stimulus is on. 
Um, so to do that analysis, you'd have to do some kind of filing rate matching between, um, uh, so you had, you'd have to pick trials in which the rate, uh, filing rate is the same as the spontaneous rate, which is uh, very unlikely. Um, but that's a, a absolutely valid question. I've not done that, but it gives me something to do. Okay, and our last question here is, uh, even if the number of dimensions in the shared su subspace does not change, mm -hmm. the subspace itself may be quite different, i.e. different neurons contributing. Did you look at that? Yes, I did. Uh, that's, again, uh, limited to these linear methods, of course. Uh, so what I did was try to predict the activity of um, the, let's say, attend out condition, but on, with the weights of the, or the weight matrix of the attend in condition, right? And try to cross predict in a way and also uh, do it in, in a principled way such that I'm cross validating these analyses. What we find is that prediction uh, does not change for within area communication, whatever. Uh, empty activity prediction numbers are pretty high, uh, even if I'm cross predicting. So within area communication subspace, is my guess would be, uh, given these linear methods, my guess would be that within area communication subspace remains the same. Across areas, on the other hand, we do see a slight performance drop when you use the other subspace, the out of condition sub a subspace to try to predict. Um, now, that does not mean that the subspace is actually changing. Uh, that means that um, my, the, because of these linear methods, I'm not able to find, um, or it could be that what is happening is that the communication is nonlinear and attention is moving from a you know, fairly linear regime in one area to a fairly linear regime elsewhere. That could be the case. So uh, again, nonlinear methods are probably better, um, uh, uh, will better answer this question. Thank you again, Ram. And thank you thank again you to all of the speakers in this session for a great set of talks. And uh, thank you to everyone listening out there for hanging with us through the minor te technical difficulty. Uh, before everyone leaves, while this brings us to the end of our final talk session for Cosign this year, it's not the end of the meeting. We still have two poster sessions ahead and we're going to have some closing remarks here uh, by, I believe, Alex Pouget, but perhaps uh, Stephanie Palmer. And while we wait for that, I just wanna thank everyone who made all of this possible. Uh, I've always enjoyed Cosign more than any other meeting and I'm really happy that we're able uh, to make it happen uh, despite these challenges. Uh, and here I see Alex, so I'm going to pass the baton uh, for him to give a brief wrap up of the meeting. Thanks team. Um, yes, I'm Alex Pouget. I'm from uh, the executive committee, a uh, committee that's composed of Tony Zador, uh, Zach Manen and uh, Stephanie Palmer. And on behalf of the committee, I just wanna make a couple of uh, closing uh, comments. Uh, first of all, I'd like to, of course, thanks uh, Anne-Marie Oswald and Surgeon Osudic for organizing the conference. In fact, uh, you guys probably don't know that, but uh, the conference almost did not take place this year. We were seriously considering canceling last fall until Anne-Marie and Surgeon uh, convinced us to otherwise, thanks to two really important arguments. Uh, first, um, they, uh, made it clear that this would be a year to try different things, and in particular to highlight the work of more junior people, since they are the ones who are suffering the most uh, from the current crisis. And so as you saw this year, uh, we decided not to have any invited talks by senior scientists, but instead only have uh, talks that were selected from um, the submitted abstract. And we thought that was a great idea. And the second thing was that uh, they pointed out that this year, uh, we could finally have a conference that's accessible to a wide audience, not just the people who can afford uh, to travel to the conference, who are even people who are allowed to travel to the conference, which is another issue. Uh, and uh, we indeed realized that uh, with the help of our sponsor, the Gatsby Borough Welcome, the Gatsby uh, Foundation, the Burroughs Welcome Foundation, Deep Mind, and the Simons Foundation, we could actually run a conference effectively for free because it's not free. Uh, typically, we rely on your registration fee, but this year, as you saw, it was mostly free or only uh, $5 for the people 
who registered late. So this is again, thanks to the support of uh, those foundations and the results were spectacular. Uh, we had 3,500 uh, participants this year, uh, just to give you the scale that's uh, more than three times the number of participants that we usually have at COSIGN. Um, I also would like to thank uh, the people who made the conference possible, uh, who, organ who, who, who organized everything online. That's Carlos Stein, uh, Thomas Romatka, and Leslie Weeks, who organized a flawless conference up until two minutes ago when I pressed on the rogue button and end up uh, the broadcasting. But without my intervention, uh, it would have been flawless. Um, and uh, on this note, I would like to already invite you to join us next year in Lisbon, hopefully in person, although I'm saying this uh, and being cautious because last June, uh, we naively thought that this conference will be in person. Obviously, uh, it didn't work according to plan. Uh, but we're pretty hopeful for next year. Uh, write down, it's going to be on March 17th to March 22nd. So about three weeks um, later than usual. We'll post, of course, those dates on the website uh, very quickly. Okay, uh, I also would like to just mention that uh, we realize that uh, we would like the people who were able to attend this year to attend again next year, even if they can't afford to come to Lisbon. So. Uh, we'll, of course, have the YouTube channel with all the talks again, and we're thinking and considering other options. If you have some suggestions, uh, you're welcome, but uh, we're already considering the possibility of having a bit of a hybrid conference. Uh, please let us know uh, how you would like this to happen. Uh, and finally, uh, I've been told that uh, there will be some informal hangouts on GatherTown at the end of the post session. Uh, I'm unlikely to join that one. I think it will be two or three in the morning for me, uh, but especially for the people who are uh, in the uh, US, Canada, and South America, uh, you're in the right time zone. So hopefully you guys can meet in some old friends and, and catch up online. So again, thanks uh, for participating and for making this conference a fantastic success again. And we look forward to seeing you next year.